Good evening. Um, my name is Rachel Cook, and I've worked in the food industry for eight years. What started as a humble process on the small scale in the kitchen, where we prepared, mixed, and cooked raw ingredients, is now a multi-billion dollar industry. As the Frenchman, Brulat Savarin, said, tell me what you eat, and I will tell you what you are. Quite simply, the story of food and nutrition cannot be separated from the story of people, lifestyle, and politics. The aim of this talk is to give you a flavor of the vast impact that chemical engineers have had on the food that you eat. Hence, I've called it 100 Years of Nourishing Chemical Engineering Thoughts. And over the next five, year, five minutes, I'm going to tell you about some of the things that chemical engineers have done, concentrating particularly in the fields of increasing productivity, extending shelf life, and meeting consumer demand. So firstly, looking at increasing production. Kevin Rodovich said, if the grass on the other side of the fence appears greener, it must be all the fertilizer they're using. A hundred years ago, in 1911, Carl Bosch and Fritz Haber were putting the finishing touches to the Haber-Bosch process to synthesize ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen. In 1913, Ammonia was made on a commercial scale for the first time using the Haber-Bosch process in BASF's Oppo plant in Germany. M ammonia is a precursor to fertilizers. And nowadays, one third of the world's population is sustained using fertilizer made from ammonia. Many people consider the Haber-Bosch process one of the outstanding chemical engineering achievements of all time, thanks to its global impact on food production. The second point I wanted to talk about was the impact on extending shelf life. And a few years later, in 1919, on the island of Labrador in Canada, a man called Clarence Birdseye was being taught how to fish by the Inuits. Here he noticed that the fish froze almost immediately, and when thawed, tasted fresh. Based on this insight, Clarence Birdseye developed entirely new processes for commercially viable quick freezing. Previously, freezing of foods had been very slow, and that led to large ice crystal formation and growth, which disrupted the cell walls, affecting the texture and the flavor. Clarence sold 168 patents to the General Foods Corporation in 1929 for an awful lot of money, and the General Foods Corporation did go on to make a commercial success of Clarence Birdseye's inventions. Moving forward in time a little bit now, to 1956, and 8% of UK households had a refrigerator. This rose to 33% in 1962, and by 1973, more than 83% of households had refrigerators. Not that I remember any of that. But the chemical engineering story of the development of refrigerants and CFCs and their subsequent replacement, HFCs, is well known to me, as I did do some work experience with ICI Clear in 1996. And here, ICI and DuPont raced to build the first HFC R134A production units. And the small team of engineers from ICI won the McRoberts Engineering Award for their process based on a chromium catalyst. My third example for increasing shelf life is about aseptic production. In aseptic production, a sterile product is packaged in a sterile container whilst maintaining the sterility of both. And in 1961, the very first aseptic filling plant for milk was presented in Switzerland by Tetra Pak. Aseptic production and packaging has drastically improved food quality, food safety, and nutrient retention. And that led it to being voted the food industry's top innovation of the last 50 years by the Institute of Food Technologists. Finally, I wanted to share a bit with you about how chemical engineers meet consumer demand. As diners, we're no longer preparing our foods as much, and we've moved from being cooks to consumers, and doing so have lost direct control of the ingredients used. Through consumer demand, mixed with pressure groups, however, there's been a reduction in the levels of salt and fat content of convenience foods, and in this, chem chemical engineers have really played a large role. Hydrogenated oils, known as trans fats, were introduced exactly 100 years ago in 1911 in the form of a product called Crisco 
which is a hard fat from cotton seeds. And Procter & Gamble marketed this as a cheap replacement to pig lard. However, in the 1980s and 90s, evidence mounted that trans fats raise cholesterol and increase the risk of coronary heart disease. And the industry acted to remove them from foodstuffs. Whereas the UK relied on voluntary measures, Denmark became the very first country in March 2003 to introduce a tax on trans fats. Denmark did then recall, recall a reduction in heart attacks, but it's very difficult, as with all nutrition and diet-related studies, to actually separate all the external controlling factors. However, Denmark then also became the first country to introduce a tax on saturated fats, and recently the French Parliament have backed an act to tax sweeteners and sugar in soft drinks. The UK government has a slightly different solution. As those of you that read the Evening Standard will know, that a month ago, the headline said, Minister's advice, obesity crisis solved, eat less. <laughs> and so in summary, food composition is becoming an increasingly political issue. And this trend's not going to stop. But chemical engineers have a really vital role to play whether it's in increasing production, extending shelf life, or meeting consumer or legislative demand. Now is definitely a very exciting time to be a chemical engineer in the area of food and nutrition. <laughs>